Anya, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's always an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And, um, you know, on this day particularly, you know, the International Day of Multilingualism, we're here celebrating multiple languages and you are also in an embodiment of what is multilingual. I mean, I don't know how many people know how many languages you speak and you speak them well. English is not, you know, a language you grew up speaking from childhood, though uh -huh. you're, you're your mastery of English is, is phenomenal. Um, you're actually German, right? <laughs> you, yes, I am. Born you're not even a fake German, German, you're a real yes. German. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us a little bit about the other languages. That's, before we get to Mexico and before we get to that, tell us a little bit about your language story, because I, I love this. Oh, yeah, me too. I love that. <laughs> um, well, born and raised in Germany, so my, my German is... Um, I've got a very high level in German, let's say. <laughs> and, um, and then I think my, my second strongest language is actually French, I think. I don't know, I don't know. Like, I think maybe it changes also, but uh, I moved to France when I was 17. I left Germany when I was 17, that's oh, 14 years ago. Um, and so I moved to France because I really wanted to learn French and um, I fell in love with the language and I think like this part um, kind of triggered me to learn more languages mm -hmm. because learning English, I mean, Richard, everyone who has been to Germany, like learning English in school is like, yeah, equis, right? As they say mm -hmm. in Mexico, equis, right? So it's like, yeah, everyone can do that. And then, yeah. But then learning French to like a very high level and at a very young age, um, I think uh, it gave me that confidence that I needed to continue with languages. And then I started with uh, more and more languages. I think like in, in terms of order, the ones that I speak best, um, well, German, <laughs> French, uh, and Spanish, English, I don't know. Uh, then uh, Portuguese is one of my very favorite languages actually. And then from there, I have a couple of languages that I've learned to an, uh, I don't know, to an A2 level, but I think I've, I've I don't know, maybe I've gotten back to an A1 level already. So um, European languages, but honestly, I, especially when I, when I moved to Canada back in 2011, I started uh, feeling the interest of like languages outside of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've, I've done a couple of European languages, but a bit more just for fun. My sister is a professional translator for German Dutch. So yeah, um, that gave me the interest too, a little bit of Dutch, a little bit of Swedish, a little bit of Italian too. Um, but then uh, I started uh, with Mandarin, when was that, like six years ago, maybe? And, um, and I did also from Asian languages, also a little bit of Japanese. But that was actually just for the Polygon conference. <laughs> <laughs> that was like my main reason. Um, and, and then I started with indigenous languages. And this is something right now that I really want to focus on. Mm -hmm. so, Coming to Mexico now, um, I moved to Mexico back in 2014, so almost seven years ago. Crazy. Um, and um, yeah, I started with Mawak uh, maybe three years ago, and then I took a break. Um, and then I got back to Nahuatl and really focusing on Nahuatl after the Polyglot Conference when we announced that we would go to Cholula. <laughs> um, that was like my motivational push also to to have a higher level, to, to be able to communicate better and now what, um, yeah. And uh, from there I started, um, well, not really focusing on other languages because I still want to get a higher level in now what. Um, and because honestly, like I can only focus on maximum two languages really. I mean, yes, the rest I can read a little bit but I don't feel that I improve. So for me, it's maximum two languages at the same time, I can't do more. Um, and since February, I started um, Nyanyu, which is a, a language spoken mostly in El Estado de Hidalgo in, in Mexico. And I started last year working with people from there. Um, and uh, that was like my main motivation to, to start with Nyanyu, oh, <laughs> which so is special. a type of Otomi. <laughs> that's so special. I mean, can I, can I ask actually, because you, I know you deal with clothes, you, you sort of people make clothes there, right? And they're, they're beautiful because I've seen the pictures. Yeah, the, yeah. These are the kinds of designs that you're wearing now. 
exactly exactly so it's all handmade and and i think this is something that in in the western world we don't value enough anymore well maybe now a bit more again um and so i started this fashion collection last year um with like everything is handmade from uh the community um Denango. well it's actually a community an hour away from Denango. And uh, that's also where they speak the language. And um, there it's actually very common to speak the language. I think in total, there's not many speakers left. I think less than 100,000, um, but uh, over there, um, still a lot. <laughs> wow, that's so nice. I mean, my trip to Mexico, so I've been there twice. Uh, once obviously to Cholula, and just before that, I went with my family to the Yucatan and we traveled around there a little bit. And Maya was actually, the Mayan language was spoken quite widely as well. And there's something about sort of, you know, championing these languages and, and doing something for them. And I think, you know, I've been working with you now with Polyglot Conference. This is our second year of working together on this. And the, the great thing about you is that, first of all, you're extremely supportive. Um, you're very responsive to to changes and to people situations and you you can almost you, you ask exactly the you know I don't know how it is but you almost know exactly the right time to say it seems like you've got a lot you're doing can I help out or is there a way I can you know take your a load off of, of your of your plate you know your your workload and then you're super organized as well like I love the organ if I had your organization <laughs> Honestly, um, it would be it would be wonderful, and but the thing that's really cool about you is that you've gone to Mexico and you're a real ambassador for Mexico and for the indigenous languages because you really put them um, on the sort of forefront of what you do with Zaloa languages. I mean, this is one of the reasons why actually I was, I was quite sad we didn't go to Mexico is because. So lower languages isn't just a language school. It's like a little family. It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> the people are so nice. And you offer now up there at the school and you offer it online as well, right? As a language um, for people to study. And yeah. you, you champion these things. And, and, and you, 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 may, you don't just say, oh, I want to do it. You actually go out and you do it. And that's the difference. And you even chose now up as a language you were going to sing or say, say the words for in the, the Moses project that was released today as well uh, for Moses McCormick. And I found that quite moving um, that, that, you, that you said those lines in now. Tell me, you know, in terms of what we can do with, with this, what other things do you think we can do to move things forward, to be more active, sort of, you know, Car Carlos um, always talks about this language activism. Uh, and in a positive way, make positive changes, particularly for these types of indigenous, endangered and vulnerable languages. One way is obviously learning them, but how do we take it steps further? And what are your thoughts and plans? Okay, so I think really this is a very good question. Um, I think everyone can and, and should also uh, contribute to, to that. So um, number one is definitely to raise awareness, right? Because things that we don't hear about, like how can we learn them if we don't even know they exist, right? So I think raising awareness and for example, even if someone says, and, and I, I've seen this now a lot in like my friend circle, people who are not actively learning an indigenous language from Nahuatl, they share our videos, they share what we do with indigenous languages, and that brings then well, more knowledge about, about the language and, and more people really get to, well, try at least uh, an indigenous language, in this case, an indigenous language from Mexico, but it could be like any language from anywhere. There's not, it's not only Mexico. Sometimes I'm just too focused on Mexico, but I mean, there's so many indigenous language, indigenous languages that need our intent, attention. So I think uh, raising awareness is, is number one. And, and that means like, Obviously, right now, social media, uh, and I mean, all kind of channels, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, talking about those languages, um, showing different things that we do, things that have to do with the language. So, for example, which goes with Nahuatl, I, I have this here because I wanted to show this. This is one of the codices, right? So codices are basically like when before the Spanish came, um, 
and before they started speaking Spanish, that was the way they would communicate in a written form, like in pyramids, for example, you would see um, the codices and, and there would be like codices telling the history of Mexico, right, before, um, before the Spanish came, basically. And this is, for example, the um, month number six of the Aztec calendar, mm -hmm. and that's the death, it represents the death, which is something positive in Mexico, nothing negative. And this is something that we also do in our classes, right? So um, this is made all with natural colors. So I only use natural colors. Actually, they have changed a lot. Um, I've done this maybe two years ago. So it's, it looks already a bit old now. But this is also something like I, I talked about this and then people were not really interested in the Nahuatl language would be super interested in the codices and it goes together, right? So I think, yeah, that's definitely point number one, raising awareness. And then point number two, like people who are watching us right now, they're all in a in a, in some way an expert in what they do, right? So I think everyone with their expertise, there's people, I don't know, really strong skills in IT, for example, or design or languages, uh, grammar structures or building courses or whatsoever. And I think this is important to like, um, work together always and to find the people that have strengths that you don't have so for example me in my case i like technology but i'm not an it person so i always need help with it and so bringing that together and and creating also learning material because it does not exist enough in my opinion and learning material for indigenous languages so these two are definitely the main points and then learning the language would be like the best, let's say, because um, that would really help to actually keep it um, directly alive. So those are the three points that I always say that everyone can help with. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, we talk about multilingualism and um, people who learn multiple languages. I think where possible, it's good to even just start scratching the surface of at least one of these um, endangered, vulnerable or indigenous languages. Um, just to sort of reach out and connect more. And also, you know, we often see in the language learning community questions about how do I find information about this language? How do I find resources? How do I, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I always say, you know, try and connect through social networks because these people are on social networks. Um, you know, I think sometimes there's an old, there's sort of an, an idea in people's heads of, oh, you know, you have to go to the Amazon to the middle of nowhere and, and buy canoe to find these people. No, these, these are, these are modern people uh, who have languages that like other languages have changed and adapted to changing circumstances in the world. The, the, these are not, um, we're not talking about languages from, from a historical past where you have to go into the middle of nowhere to, to speak them. Um, of course, there are languages like that that exist, of course. Um, and there are, there are places where we can't go still, like North Sentinel Island. The North Sentinelese don't welcome visitors um, and it's actually prohibited to go there. But um, there, are, there are many, 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 many languages. And these people are going around with mobile phones, the same as everyone else and connecting to each other and figuring out who speaks them and building those communities. And that's what it is. It's a question of building the communities and exactly. linking people together. And when you link people together, that's where the magic happens. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. I also see here in the chat someone writing in Nahuatl, so that makes me very happy. which means muchas gracias. Thank you very much. So, Amitla. Oh, I love it, Amitla. Um, yeah, it, 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 is, it is incredible when you sort of dig a little deeper. So one of the really cool things about, uh, this sounds really wrong to say the sentence, but I'm going to say it anyway. One of the cool things about COVID, <laughs> it's, it's so wrong. It's not COVID itself. The virus is not cool. And the COVID is not welcome in my house. But one of the cool things about um, having everything move online is that it's brought uh, a wealth of resources for a number of languages that otherwise I would never have had the opportunity to study. So when this whole thing started with the pandemic, I, I was able to join a North Army class and I did that for like quite a few months. Wow. Then I did a Scots class um, 
in the summer with the University of Edinburgh. Then I did, um, I started Cornish and Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, which again, never get the chance to study languages normally in a, in a, in a class. Um, and now I'm, I'm following a Maya class, a Mayan class in Maya in, in Spanish um, with, with a school based in, in, in Merida in, uh, in the Yucatan. And I can't actually go to the lessons live because I'm, it's like three in the morning or something crazy for me. But um, <laughs> I watch the recordings. They, they record them and I watch the recordings. And it's, it's so nice just to sort of to hear these languages. And likewise, I mean, I, I, I've got to say I'm, I'm very bad because I started watching uh, the course on Zaloa for, um, for Nawath. And then I, I don't know what happened, but I stopped probably something crazy happened because it normally does. But now I'm thinking, I want to go back to Nawath again. Yeah, um, do it, do it. And, and I mean, you know, also my teacher, right? Awesome. A lot of people know him here because he has given a talk at the Polygraph Conference. Uh, and he had actually also workshops about uh, um, drawing codices or painting them actually. And uh, he's amazing, isn't he? he's so impressive and he's such an approachable and nice person as well yeah. um just very encouraging and uh, and i love his can-do attitude when it comes to teaching and learning uh now and i would love um I'd and love sorry, i guess that's also another yeah that's also another thing that you when you ask like what can you do to to or what can people do to like um help or to be more like well i don't like the word activist but uh let's say to support indigenous mm -hmm. languages right like to support those people who actually know the language um, and to help them creating material out of it but also to encourage them because what happens mostly what i see with a lot of indigenous uh, language teachers is that often like from a financial point of view it's not worth it to do that so they leave it and they do another job, right? Because who wants to learn that language? That's always the question. And so I guess in that way, it's also important if you, for example, have a bigger audience and then you can support them. And even with a smaller audience, you can support them, right? Supporting those people who help the languages. Um, that's also, I think, uh, and Richard, you were, <laughs> I think the superstar in doing that. <laughs> Because <laughs> you've done that with us, but not only with us, with the law in general, and, and with so many other people who create material on on languages that need maybe more awareness. So honestly, like uh, I think Richard is in many ways a great inspiration, but maybe a lot of people don't know that how you actually help those those people. So um, it's amazing, honestly. Really, I'm I will be forever grateful for everything that you have done. Uh, for us and for now wetland just bringing the conference to to mexico is is like raising awareness about those languages right so oh, I, can't, I cannot wait i cannot wait to go uh back to mexico and and i and i i think you know one of the things just to listen to you speaking then if if there are groups of us in the language learning community that want to learn a language there's nothing stopping us forming our own classes and then finding the teacher Hmm. So that's also an option, whether you do that on a private basis or whether you do it as a group and you agree, OK, well, maybe we don't have much money to pay for one teacher one on one. But maybe if you form a group, you kind of you create the class and then you find the teacher because these teachers are out there. There are teachers for many of these um, indigenous Mexican languages, as well as a number of other languages around the world. And it, it really is quite rewarding. Uh, to, to start learning them and uh, you know I, my, my only issue is I keep wanting to learn them all <laughs> I just see them all and they're all shiny and beautiful and and I, I, I would love to learn all of the languages um, and someone okay. says you know if they ever ask me if anyone ever asked me is there a language you wouldn't want to learn I'm like no no, no right no, <laughs> impossible no. Yeah, I understand. I just saw in this Q and A section here that uh, Olga uh, said um, hello from Regensburg. So I just wanted to say hi to Olga as well. And for example, Olga reminded me how also music can help indigenous languages. Right? There's a lot of things, um, songs from 
500, 600 years ago that exist in Nahuatl, right? So I've been learning one of the nicest songs to learn Nahuatl was, um, um, how do you say that in English? Una canción de cuña, o sea, like to, to oh, make. Oh, yeah, a lullaby. A lullaby. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And so that was because the melody was so nice and, and the words were easy. And so um, I like that one and I still like listen to it from time to time. <laughs> and, and Olga is for me, like the example of, you know, like what she did with the concert at the Pilgrim Conference, amazing. And so honestly, Olga, if you're still here with us, I can't wait to, to hear you one day in Nahuatl, hopefully. <laughs> like oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I, I, still, <laughs> I still can't believe the concert that Olga gave us at the end of the conference. It was just so special. Yeah. And I'll, I'll forever be grateful for, for that. Such a talented person. Unbelievable. Yeah, extremely Unbelievable. talented. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely cheap. amazing. So I and, guess through music, if you're into music, you can also do a lot of things. You can like, uh, I don't know, record songs in, in those uh, languages and, and play them. And, and even if you don't understand the language perfectly, like just through, singing it and, and sharing it it's amazing yeah I mean you're gonna have to find that uh, song so that we can link it as well in the uh, oh, yeah I will I will that, that would be a lovely see. thing to, to find it right now and I can do it in the chat oh brilliant and then we can share it on the um, on the video when it comes out too I mean when we talk about these sort of making materials and we, we sort of help with the, with the teachers there are other challenges as well with these languages. Um, one of the things that I found in Mexico with, with Mayan particularly, and I'm guessing this is the same with, with, um, for, with, with Nahuatl as well, is that when you speak to speakers of these languages, um, often they're not aware that you can write the languages and represent them with, um, with the Latin alphabet. And they, they seem to think that these languages are still written with the, the codices. And so you have to learn these really complex uh, pictorial, you know, these images, uh, almost as complicated or more complicated than Chinese, right? When you look at them. And, and, they, and, and sometimes there's kind of a misconception because they're not taught as often in, in a formal school education, you know, as, as, as a language that they learn at school. It's just something they speak at home with with grandma and with mum maybe or someone like something like that how, how do how do we move forward to get more recognition i know this is something that's close to your heart and what kind of things can 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 people do to to do this in other parts of the world um yeah i guess um, obviously everything that that i've already uh, mentioned um but your question is, is not about awareness, but you said recognition, right? Yeah, getting recognition and being that so that people in communities are, are, can get some, some education in the language so that their awareness level of their own language is also heightened so that they yeah. know they can they can write it with, with the Latin letters. It's not just codifice that they, they have to learn and are scared of because it looks super complicated. Yeah, so recognition, well, um, maybe it's not the <laughs> answer to your question, but this point about recognition, I think, is is extremely important because what I found, and, and it really, <laughs> it broke my heart, like one of the first times when, when we started practicing Nahuatl um, at a like local market in, in Cholula, where there was this special day where you would exchange. So instead of paying with money, you would bring I don't know, you would bring cookies and you would exchange them for apples, for example, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I like those things. And, and so there I was, uh, we went with our whole Nahuatl group, um, study group. And, uh, and so one of my friends started asking a, a, a woman like about, I don't know, 60 maybe. And he said to her, so, uh, usted habla Nahuatl, so do you speak Nahuatl? And the woman said, no and she was like sitting like no chair but sitting on the on the ground in like the marketplace and he was standing right so i thought that was also first mistake because you're talking to a person um down to her right so I'm like, okay and i was just i was listening to that and i was like that woman just spoke to her husband and now what so I approached her again and, and we tried that then a different way. And we said like, listen, it's, it's, it's really 
So we started learning your language and, and we really enjoy it. And, and I, I've learned the sentence and would you mind listening to the sentence and say me and tell me if, if that's correct or if, if there is any way that I could, uh, I don't know, do a better pronunciation. And she's like, yeah, sure. And so I guess this is one of the things they don't even, it's not only about the writing system, but also they don't even like to say that they speak the language because they feel ashamed of the language, right? And I think that's the case in, in many countries. So showing those people recognition is, 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 is a key to, to improve um, the, the knowledge also about that. And because that way, if a person doesn't even feel proud of speaking the language, then what happens? They don't even um, talk to their kids anymore in that language because they don't want their kids to suffer the same way uh, they have suffered in school, right? Yeah. And and so I guess that's very important to go to those people. And Richard, I remember you're you're one of the best in, in just like approaching people also and 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 showing them your respect. And and I think you're a big example um, for that. So that's oh, a very important. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it, it is it is important to remember that there's. For a lot of these people, there's stigma attached uh, to to some of the indigenous languages, and um, they. I mean, this is this is actually not something just unique to Mexico or or in, indeed other parts of the world outside uh, of Europe. Even in Europe, where you know where I grew up, my my great grandparents spoke Welsh, uh, but it was seen as a disadvantage to pass the language on and it was punished at school for speaking the language. Um, people had to wear a wooden block around their necks if they were caught speaking Welsh. And the, the, the children were taught then to tell on other children. So if they heard another child speaking Welsh, they told the teacher or the person responsible and they passed the wooden block onto the next child. And at the end of the day, the child who was wearing the wooden block would be beaten. Uh, for speaking Welsh and stories like that and then not not being able to use the language um, and this has happened in, in many countries I've just seen a comment there it happened in Ireland too it happened in many many countries uh, where people were not allowed or forcibly removed from their parents their families to go and live in um, particularly in some of the English-speaking countries with families of English speaking families and they were they were separated so that they lost the language the languages were killed it was linguicide and um well that was the that was the hope anyway at the time to, to kill off the languages to make it one language one unified just English or just Spanish or just whatever um the thing is is that when when we as a as a society grow a conscious con a conscious uh, sorry a conscience for uh, this kind of issue Unfortunately, a lot of that damage is already done. And, and so what, what we end up with is like for sort of the generations in Wales afterwards and, and indeed in Ireland, or now you see as well still in, in Mexico, um, this idea of, well, what's the point of that language? There's no economic value to it. Um, you know, it, it's been decimated to the point now that everyone speaks English anywhere, everyone speaks Spanish anyway. So why bother? Um, we don't get it. I mean, in Wales, fortunately, we're on the increase again. So people are being educated in Welsh and it's a, it's a happier ending, right, for Welsh. But we're not quite there yet with Mexico and with a lot of the indigenous languages in Mexico. Uh, I think with Mayan, we're probably in a better place than with Nahuatl, um, as from my understanding of, of the sort of this. It's not perfect either with Mayan. There's, there's, there's a way to go, but there is some education available. And the fact that I'm doing a course online through a language school shows you that it's it, it's not in as bad a situation, but there's still a way to go. Welsh is thankfully on a, in, a, in a very good position and we're aiming for 1 million Welsh speakers by 2050 now. Uh, yeah, and who's aiming for that? The government, right? Who sets those goals? Isn't yeah. it the government? In the end? Yeah. I guess that's also an important role. Like what I see also with my friends of mine from Merida or from that region, they had all at least a year of Mayan language in school and that was mandatory. So it's like, 
obviously that helps you also as a child when you're maybe nine or 10 and you have a year of, of that language, you won't speak it fluently, it doesn't matter, but it helps you to value the language, to um, understand at least the meanings that, that you're surrounded by of, of the streets, of the food that often have Mayan names as well, or not what names too, right? So it, it helps you to understand your own country better in the end. And, and I guess what, from my understanding with Welsh, from my friends who have learned Welsh and from what I know uh, from you is that also the government has helped a lot, right? Yeah, I mean, that the, the, they all make, I mean, the, the Welsh uh, parliament is, it has that as an objective. And, um, and, and so that's something they're working hard to. In fact, uh, Welsh language materials right the way up to a very high level now are available free online. Um, you, can, you can learn Welsh very, very easily online now. Um, and you don't even need to worry about buying expensive books or resources. You can, there is everything you'd need to learn Welsh from the very beginning, right the way up to a very advanced level. Um, it's all very accessible. The BBC website as well. You've, you've got um, translations where you can click on words that you don't know and it will explain it. It's not, it's not just a Google Translate version. It's actually um, quite a good um, help for people who want to read news articles in Welsh or whatever else. And it would be great to see that kind of thing. And I guess only by raising things from the ground up do you build that that momentum, right? And that pressure to be able to, to hopefully get noticed and to say, let's make some noise about Nahuatl. Let's make some noise about uh, other languages um, that are indigenous and or endangered in the world. And hopefully as a community, we can help in that process and make a difference. Like our personal goals, like you asked at the beginning of, of what can people do and what I want to do in my personal goals, it's definitely, in the next well now it's five no it was five years last year so four years from now that the same happens in in the center of mexico that in schools they would teach it so that would obviously also value the teacher <laughs> those who speak the language and then also it would start with the kids right and um and i think that's that's the future but we can only do that obviously through the government so um what we try to do is is to raise more awareness and more awareness until the government is going to tell us hopefully one day <laughs> okay from now on everyone has at least a year of now at Lynn school well you know what's you know what's interesting in in the uk because the uk is quite a good example for this especially wales um is they had bilingual schools in welsh so they, they've been in existence for a while and we've had welsh education for a while um but there were English speaking families that chose the Welsh school because they outperformed the English only schools. And they grew in popularity over, over a few decades because the children were doing better, not just learning Welsh, they were doing better in other subjects as well, like maths and science and, and whatever else, because they were thinking about things in different ways. They were going about, you know, that's the, the, the neuroplasticity um, you know, Thomas talks about, and um, Thomas specializes in, they were able to sort of reason in different ways and think and look at the world in a different way from a different perspective. And the, they, they outperformed the uh, monolingual English schools. So it's interesting that families that didn't even have Welsh as a language reintroduced the language to their children uh, into the new next generation, which I think is, is a great sign. And that's the thing about multilingualism is people talk about which one's got financial benefit, which one for economic or political reasons is, is the more, more important or the bigger language. When it comes to the brain, a language is a language is a language is a language. And the benefits to your brain and to your, your abilities, it doesn't actually matter which language that is, whether it's Mayan, whether it's Nawa, whether it's Welsh, whether it's Irish, whether it's North Sami, or whatever it is, the benefits, the health benefits and the benefits to you as an individual are the same. And the other benefit that you get educationally is when you come to another language, you're going to have a way easier job of learning another language because you're using two on a daily basis where you are anyway, instead of just one. And you're used to different grammatical structures. You're used to different words. And what that means, and people often ask, you know, 
as wh why is it easier to learn a third language if the other two are not even related? Well, very short answer to that. You're used to different grammars and how they work. So you can bend your mind around a new grammar more easily than a monolingual. Second reason is that with vocabulary, you need hooks to make memories, to link words. And if you have more words and more sounds in your vocabulary, in your head, you have more chances of making memorable stories to memorize words more easily and to remember them and then to use them as well. Because you can imagine another word for dog or cat more easily than you can if you just have one language and you don't get it what it is to speak another language. I just see a little bit of the chat as well. I'm so hoping to learn an indigenous Egyptian language. Wow. Wow, that's interesting. Very, very interesting. A lot of people here in, in well, some of them saying that they, they're they learning one or that they want to learn one. So I guess that's also, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm more in this world right now, but I feel like over the past three years, for Nahuatl or for indigenous languages in Mexico, I feel that the situation has improved. Like when I started this, I even had to often justify myself and people would tell me why do you do that i still get the question <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, why do you do that it's useless you know like those kind of comments like every story i would do about my nahuatl class because i do a lot of instagram stories about the nahuatl classes and then and so um yeah i still get that from time to time those comments like it's useless or don't waste your time with that or things like that um and I think I also respond better now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's good. Learning, learning to sort of respond in a in an appropriate way takes. Yeah. it's an art. Yeah. An art form. Question: Why do you think that? So that the person can like, because clearly there is a need to express himself or herself. Right. So <laughs> it's definitely. Um, I listen then and then I say, okay, yeah, but have you considered no, 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 and sometimes it works and sometimes it does not, and then that's okay, I guess, um, but yeah, I feel that it has improved, so we're definitely, in, in terms of Nahuatl, in a good way for many other 68 indigenous languages in Mexico, so that's why I keep saying Mexico is a paradise for languages, and I mean, so many languages, like someone now here, Mark, saying in the chat, the indigenous Egyptian language, like, I have no clue about indigenous languages in Egypt and I would love to know so how interesting like wow yeah. really I really like that actually one of the things and you say this sort of indigenous languages and I know that for a lot of people they, they you know a lot of people do sort of have this idea of oh these are the villages in the middle of nowhere no one really speaks them it's so not the case in Mexico um people really use these languages I heard Mayan spoken so much in the Yucatan um it was actually it blew me away um, that I heard it so much, uh, especially, you know, go, driving around. Okay, I mean, in touristy areas, you hear more Spanish, but you didn't have to drive very far and you didn't have to drive to somewhere extremely remote to start hearing it. It would, you would hear the language. And I think that's, that's one of the things that I, that really pleasantly surprised me with Mexico um, is it truly is multilingual in that way. Definitely, yeah, yeah. What a what a beautiful day to to celebrate all that and 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 to raise awareness about that. And everyone who's here is clearly interested in in that topic, right? And and from there, so at Zalo, we always use the dandelion as as our symbol. And and the meaning behind this is that we say once you like, first of all, when you blow the dandelion, you have this wish, right? So you. Um, have a wish about yourself in the future maybe you want to speak a certain language with fluency or whatever that wish might be but especially what happens with the dandelion is when 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 the seeds start spreading the dandelion like you find them everywhere in the end and and I think that's also uh, our potential and, and when I say our I don't mean just you and me or, or just the people you've, you've been speaking to during the day today, but everyone who has joined uh, mm -hmm. today, who has been part of this in the chat or in this Q&A part. So um, amazing. We are all these 
seeds that are going to spread everywhere. <laughs> exactly. And let's spread more of that uh, love for Indigenous, endangered and vulnerable languages around the world. And let's take a stand and, and make a difference. And um, thank you so much. Um, if you are interested in Nahuatl, I can highly recommend going to Zoloa, uh, to Zoloa Languages, the website. Um, we'll put a link as well for you so you can go there and have a look at the Nahuatl course um, and, and maybe choose Nahuatl as your language that you're going to learn. Um, it would certainly be a really good thing to be able to do for when you go to Cholula and imagine, imagine the videos you can make to share uh, for other people to have things to look at in Nahuatl on social media. What a great way to celebrate Mexico, to celebrate uh, multilingualism. Thank you so, so much. Is, we, have a, we have an online quiz. It's a video course. It's it's 10 sessions with, I don't know, like around 30 videos. And it's it's on a donation basis. So um, that's also important, I guess, to to give really everyone who wants to learn the language access to it. And, and whoever can donate and, and help creating more material is, is very much welcome to donate. And even if not, really don't feel bad about it. For me, the most important is that more and more people start downloading this course and, and start using the course actually thank you that's very generous of you and and uh please i encourage you to go to the site and to and to look at the now after course and consider even if you learn a bit it's better than not learning any exactly as um you know the famous polyglot um uh, catalome said a language is the only thing worth learning even badly because the bit is better than nothing <laughs> Anya it's been a pleasure Definitely. it's been a pleasure speaking to you thank you for I promised myself I would say I would use this session also to say thank you to you because everyone who's still here with us right now and if you're in Europe it's, it's already very late for you guys <laughs> but I wanted to say really from the bottom of my heart thank you Richard because Richard started at 7 a.m this morning 9 a.m what was that <laughs> yeah okay a bit crazy hours in the morning <laughs> it's basically like 14 hours of, of interviews and talking to people and all that like no one asked you really to do that you had this motivation to say let's do it and Honestly, it's it's so inspiring and amazing and everything you're giving to this community. Um, I truly think it's it's unique because you're not get, even getting paid for this. We're doing this the whole day. So basically you gave us, the Polygon community, your day. And um, and I think, uh, well, for everyone who can like send something in the chat, applause or whatever, please do it. Because really, mi, mi gracias, danke, danke, danke for everything that you've been doing for that special day today, really <laughs> amazing and very inspiring. Thank you. That's really kind of you to say, thank you. It's been a pleasure, actually. I feel a bit of a cheat because I got to speak to lots of lovely people all day. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a win-win for me, really. <laughs> so I got to I got to enjoy lots of great conversations and and see lots of nice comments and and sort of I've just been drowning in in loads of the social media in between all these chats and it's just been lovely. So yeah, thank you all for coming and for being part of this and let's flood um, the internet with our hashtags. Um, multilingual is normal, multilingual day. And of course, Laoshu 55,000 forever. Thank you. <laughs> See you soon. You Take soon. care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.